Hey, what's up guys? It's Technical Tim here, and I want to thank everyone so much who's been liking all my videos and subscribing to the channel. And I'd really appreciate it if you gave this video a thumbs up or subscribe if you haven't already. And I'm just going to do a quick recap of UFC 243. And just so you know, the way I do this, I kind of just go through each card and just talk about it from a technical and betting um, perspective and talk about what I was thinking before and after the fight. And, sorry, let me pull it up. I thought I had it up. So, yeah, but overall in the night, I, uh, just seen, I, I didn't do a Final Thoughts video last week. Um, if you watch, if you listen to the podcast, you all knew I was on Adesanya. Um, I just played him a unit and a half and at, at plus money, so that hit. And then, um, I also, I didn't, I talked about it in the podca podcast a little bit, about how I like these two, but I wasn't sure if I was going to bet. I ended up pulling a one-unit play on Kim that hit, and then I parlayed up Jake Matthews with uh, Kerry Melendez as well. So all my bets hit, so that was good. Um, but yeah, I'll just kind of like go through. Uh, Khalid Taha and Bruno Silva. This fight was kind of like what I expected. I think uh, I don't... I don't like Taha at his like minus 210 line. He was probably not the value side there because Silva obviously had a path and he was kind of hitting it in the second round a little bit with his, his, his grappling. But um, Taha just kind of stayed tough and got a nice submission. So, um, yeah, good win for him. Kim and Kasim. So I ended up playing a unit on Kim. The reason I pulled my bet back a little bit on this, like I thought Kim was going to be fine. But my worry was... In a lot of her fights, she doesn't put emphasis on rounds. I mean, you, but you could attribute that to the fact that she's fought good fighters. And Tammy Shevchenko has one of the best striking differentials at flyweight, and she's incredibly, um, she's incredibly underrated. It's just she kind of like got. If you can grapple her, yeah. But if you're if you can't really grapple her, you're you're kind of fucked. And that's why I played Shevchenko over Pudilova, and I could not believe that line. The striking numbers were off the charts for Shevchenko in that matchup. But Kim's fought some tough girls, but she... So, like, of course she didn't put major emphasis on some rounds, but I still just, like, she didn't offensively wrestle enough to, like, guarantee top position. And in the striking, like, she threw a lot, but she would get hit a little bit and just didn't always put emphasis on rounds. But at the same time, it was against a lot better people. And what I was th seeing for Kasim is just she wasn't really going to be, like, in top position all that much because that's just not how she fights, and she falls to her back a lot. So if it went to the floor, I thought Kim would have a little more top position. And it, there ended up not being too much grappling here. I think Kasim had a quick takedown, and they popped back up. But Kasim just, I thought... <laughs> Her ways to score were kind of just spamming together some combinations, and Kim ended up just walking her down, gassing her out, and putting her away. So, um, I, like, so I thought Kasim was just limited in win conditions, but at the same time, I didn't think, like, that first round was still kind of close, and that that's what I was afraid of what would, would happen the whole fight, is if Kim just kind of didn't put stamp on striking rounds. So that's kind of why I, I pulled it back a little bit, but... Um, the people who, I got Israel at plus money, but I did not get that, um, that Kim plus money that people jumped on earlier in the week. So I just played her like minus 163 line yesterday. So I ended up getting that. Uh, Megan Anderson, Dos Santos, I, I missed like the first minute or two of this fight, which means I only saw a couple minutes of this fight, but yeah, some sloppy grappling exchanges and, um, never like... <laughs> I'm just going to tell you guys, uh, never play Megan Anderson over minus 300. Just don't do it. It should just be a rule. Never to do it because she can. she's really bad on the floor. I don't care that she got a triangle. Like Both of these girls just were not that skilled down there. And she has way too big of a grappling liability to ever... Like, playing her minus 500, I don't care that the bet cashed. It was fucking stupid. It's just... It, there's no excuse for it in my opinion it's just a bad bet um she has way too big of a, a hole that many people can expose i mean holly holm looked like a legitimate grappler against megan and i don't think it was because holly's actually good at grappling it's just because megan's that that um low level on the floor and i don't like talking shit on fighters like that anderson's super athletic and she's a good striker and she's she can hit hard but grappling's just not her thing and there's <laughs> It's okay to, like, point that out. 
Uh, Riddle Malarkey. Fight kind of like, I didn't know, there's some unknowns going in this fight, but Riddle looked pretty good overall, but Malarkey had some some moments where he almost got a rear naked choke, almost landed some, some bombs, but I, I was impressed with Riddle as an Australian with some of his defensive wrestling. Um, he, he just had a good understanding of wizards and kind of a posting off with his free hand whenever he had his wizard on the other side with his other with his other arm. So, yeah. Uh, Potter Patolo. I, I talked about this on the podcast. Like, I, I didn't understand. I can't believe Patolo got up to minus 400. And, I mean, I'm not trying to say I told you so because I, it's not like I played Potter or anything. I just... It, this was like a, a dog or pass fight, in my opinion, and I usually pass on those and just kind of don't fuck with them. But the thing about Patolo is, even though he's like a big favorite there, and I, I agreed that he probably was going to win on the feet and kind of bully up Potter a little bit, but at the implied odds, I thought it was, I thought those, that line was probably pretty off just because there's one area in the fight where Potter's just better, <laughs> the grappling. And so... I just feel like in a fight like that where Patolo two fights ago, I talked about he got clenched up against a cage a little too easily with his grappling, and I could have seen something like that happening here in this fight. At the same time, I thought Potter showed a lot of weaknesses too that Patolo could expose, but there were threats coming Patolo's way as far as like a round winning um, win condition, meaning Potter could just out grapple him if, if it gets there. And so I just thought as like a minus three to four hundred favorite, whether you wanted him in a parlay or something, there's just too big of a risk. And I'm going to differentiate that fight with the Jake Matthews fight, who was similar odds to Patolo. He's like around minus 300 or something. And I, I played him. And the reason why I played Matthews and not Patolo is because Potter was just better in a whole area of mixed martial arts compared to Patolo. And it was clear on tape. And it was like even like just their credentials, it was clear. For Matthews and Ackman, the way I saw this was Matthews is a way better grappler offensively and defensively, so he can't lose rounds via grappling. And then on the feet, I don't like um, Matthews' output all that much. He, he only lands about three significant strikes per minute, but he doesn't get hit. He only gets hit two times. So I figured, okay, so like, that's good because he can't get out grappled and he's probably not going to get landed on all that much because he doesn't get hit a lot. So then I looked at Ackman's striking numbers and there, there's a lack of tape on him because he just kind of came up from the regionals, but against like a pretty lower level dude who's not as good as Jake Matthews, Ackman landed 38 strikes and got landed on 60, which means he got landed on four strikes per minute and he landed like two and a half. And so the fact that he only landed 39 strikes against uh, um, against kind of like a lower level fighter, and now he's going up against Matthews, I was projecting him to land at most about 30 strikes. And then Matthews, I was thinking, if he lands three against normal, better UFC competition, and Ackman is kind of just going up against now um, a better fighter himself, that... He should probably land, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but I was just figuring his average striking rate of landing about three strikes per minute for Matthews is probably going to go up because of the, he's going down in competition in this fight. And I was projecting like that Matthews would probably land about 60 to 30 strikes. It ended up being 59 to 14. And so I kind of just thought Ackman has to KO him because he's not going to sub him. He's not going to win rounds via grappling. And on the feet, He's not going to win rounds either because he's at a huge volume edge. And it's really just going to be a matter of can he clip him? And I just thought Ackman doesn't really hit hard and Matthews has never been standing KO'd. So I kind of like eliminated all the possible win conditions that Ackman could have. Like this is MMA. Shit can ha happen. Ackman, I don't know, maybe Matthews just decided to not strike that night and just kind of they had a staring contest. Like so yeah, Ackman could maybe win a decision that way in like a low volume fight. But overall... I just eliminated and minimized kind of the percentages allocated to all of his win conditions. Where with Potter and Patolo, you can't do that. Potter, like Potter had a full out grappling edge over Patolo, and Patolo, he, he was getting caught up against a cage just two fights ago. So sorry for that rant, but I just wanted to point out the fact that if you're using a parlay leg in the minus 300s, which I do, like I do a lot, 
you you need to you need to kind of just eliminate all the win conditions and that's actually something we'll be doing next week in a fight where someone's in the minus 300 range and I think it's a mismatch for that person and she's going to going to win pretty easily. I'm talking about Joanna. Um next fight Castro Tafa, just heavyweight stuff. I expected probably an early KO and it happened. Uh Lima Jumo. Um yeah, like I thought it was going to be a pretty close fight on the feet. Both guys are pretty low volume. It ended up being like a 30 to 24 in the total strikes. And I thought Lima was maybe the more willing grappler. So that fight kind of played out like I expected. I thought it would be like semi-close. And yeah, that's it. Spivak and Tuivasa. Gugabe played Spivak, which is hilarious. And um, yeah, Spivak actually looked good here. I was impressed. I mean, I was kind of like talking a lot of shit in the last months that I'd always cite Spivak and Harris as an example of just how people don't respect the fact that they don't respect the UFC competition factor all that often. We're like, Harris has beaten a lot of good heavyweights where Spivak was a debutante and generally debutantes aren't that good. But the thing is like Spivak actually looked pretty decent. His grappling is not bad at all. I was pretty impressed for a heavyweight. Like I'm not saying he's going on a title run or anything, but he was a lot better than I had thought, you know, <laughs> so, so yeah, but, um, Tuivasa obviously can't grapple that well, so Spivak benefited from that, but Spivak kind of just dominated him, and, yeah, that's pretty much it. Hooker, I, Quinta, I was a leaning hooker, um, if you guys listen to the podcast, I ended up not playing it, um, you can always regret something like that after you see the fight, but it's really easy to say that we, we don't have hindsight when we're making these decisions, and obviously, um, and obviously, like, if I if I had known Hooker would dominate, I would have bet him. But you don't always know that. And I thought he was going to win. He, he did it a little easier than I thought he would. Um, so, yeah. Then Israel and Whitaker. I played Izzy here. And I played him a unit and a half. So, like, kind of like my average play. So, nothing huge. Nothing, like, too small either. But, yeah, I just thought the, the, the defensive metrics showed it in their striking stats that Israel is a lot harder to hit. And you saw that, like Israel, usually he throws, I think, I think he attempts about 30 strikes less in the first round compared to other rounds. And that kind of showed here. It's usually because he's kind of like Hakeem Dewadu, where Dewadu's like that too. And that can be dangerous in a three round fight. But in a five round fight, I think Hakeem and Israel does now, they, they benefit from the switch to three to five rounds because they have like a round, which isn't as big of a portion of the fight in a five-rounder, obviously, to kind of feel out their opponent and then dominate. And if you look at the de the defensive metrics, it showed, like, Israel's defensive numbers were a lot better, and they're against better strikers, in my opinion, and Whitaker's defensive metrics were actually worse against Natal and Uriah Hall, and those guys throw kicks. So I figured the fact that a lot of Whitaker's... They were still good defensive metrics, but I didn't think they were as good... Um, compared as good as as good as uh, Israel's, and the fact that he did it against a lot of wrestle boxers who don't throw kicks, I figured it would be even skewed more. Um, I didn't think this was a shoe in of a fight, so I'm not going to act like this was an easy money pick. But I just thought we had an edge. Like I I, I put Izzy around six out of ten, and um, he he looked like Whitaker still did good in the first round, but I think it was a lot of until he got knocked down. But I think it was a lot of just Israel kind of feeling him out because Israel had attempted half the strikes of Whitaker to that point and still landed the same. And that just showed Israel was a lot better defensively and he lands at a higher rate. So I kind of just thought it was that. Like their volume numbers are pretty close as far as how much they land. But then you have to kind of start adjusting for defense. I feel like defense really comes into play when there's two similar guys who throw a similar amount of strikes. So um, that's kind of what I thought in Israel, like, he also had the height and reach, and that was a reason why I thought we got an edge, like, I didn't max him or anything, and I, I think, before the fight, to be completely honest, I thought, like, Israel was a solid bet, but I still had, like, doubts, like I would in any fight, I have doubts, and even Jack Shore, where Jack Shore, I was very, I was confident he was going to win, but I don't, I, and he ended up, like, completely dominating, but even before, um, I still understood there are win conditions for the other for the other side for Hernandez, and even after, 
I still understand shit can happen, and every fight's a little different, and shit just sometimes happens, but you just have to, uh, nothing's absolute in this game, and you just kind of have to look at the, the, the different win conditions for each guy and just allocate percentages to it, and sometimes you're going to make a good pick and win, sometimes you're going to make a good pick and lose, sometimes you're going to make a, a good pick and, um, or a bad pick and end up winning, so it just kind of is what it is, and you just have to play the percentages in this game and not be too absolute-minded in these things, because I, I see, a, like, even, like, Luke Thomas, uh, he, he, he's, like, kind of, like, just gloating about his Israel pick, and I don't even think he picked him. I, like, <laughs> I don't know, but, uh, but, like, if you were that confident, you would throw, like, 50 grand on Israel, you know what I mean? So you kind of have to put your money where your mouth is sometimes and, and not not kind of use hindsight as uh, as 2020, you know? But, um, yeah, that's everything. And I, the next card is the Joanna and, and Watterson card. And um, I'll just tell you now, like, like I think Joanna's a good parlay leg. And I, I tipped her out when she was about minus 300. I... Uh, I personally got her from minus 200 to minus 330, but I tipped her out around like minus 320 or something, which she, I tipped it out like three weeks ago. And um, I'll give reasons why I think she's going to kind of dominate Waterson later. But the line is kind of going up, though, and kind of getting to where it should be. But I have a few... I have like about three money line plays on my eye right now, but I kind of want to confirm them before I... I, I, I um. I tip them out to you guys. So just stay tuned. And if you have any comments, please comment below. Thanks, guys.